In search of answers to their inquiring questions, people have been observing the star-spangled sky for thousands of years. Natural laws slowly but inevitably yielded to their efforts and revealed the true magnitude of space. The bright sun, the mysterious moon and planets traversing the sky following intricate trajectories, all these amazing and unusual objects are part of the solar system. Today, I am inviting you to join me on a journey that will allow us to get to know some of the most remarkable ones closer. We will start out immersing ourselves in the past to witness the disappearance of dinosaurs from the face of the Earth and the formation of our planet as the continents slowly shifted to shape its surface we know today. After that, we will fly over the surface of Mars and check out the most exciting features of its terrain. Next, our journey will take us to the asteroid belt, which is literally stacked with secrets and treasures, and then we will make Kwawa's acquaintance, a mysterious object located at the very edge of the system. At the end, we will whiz as far away from our Earth as to be able to observe the solar system from without. The sensors of the interstellar space probes that left the Earth decades ago will become our eyes. In spite of all challenges they have to face, they still continue their arduous journey through millions of kilometers of space vacuum. Cosmo, the first in outer space. Roughly 66 million years ago, our planet went through one of the most large-scale extinction events in the history of multicellular life forms. Entire classes of species were wiped off the face of the Earth. Others changed beyond all recognition in order to adapt to the new conditions and survive. The reasons for this dramatic event are still not known for certain. Still, there is no doubt that the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction made great changes to what our planet looked like. The majestic and horrifying dinosaurs were superseded by creatures not less impressive. Mammals Three-fourths of all living organisms on Earth died out in the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. Almost all creatures heavier than 25 kilos ceased to be, including practically all non-avian dinosaurs. This tragic event heralded the end of the Mesozoic and the beginning of the Cenozoic, the geologic era that is still not over. It is divided into three periods of various duration, which are different both in terms of climate and diversity of the biosphere. The first and longest is known as the Paleogene. It began around 66 million years ago and continued for 43 million years. In the first 10 million years of the Paleogene, the Earth's biosphere was recovering from the hard blow dealt by the mass extinction. This geological epoch is referred to as the Paleocene. Since great numbers of dinosaurs and other species of the Cretaceous had perished, there were lots of vacant ecological niches for the taking. These were promptly filled by the new masters of our planet, mammals. The geography of the Earth of that period was drastically different from what we're used to seeing today. Looking at a map of that prehistoric Earth, we would already be able to make out the familiar continents, but they were positioned slightly differently. Thus, North and South Americas were separated by tropical seas, while the Indian subcontinent was just starting to make for the Asian shores. The prehistoric ocean, known as the Tethys, still lay between Africa and Eurasia, but was already largely giving way due to the movements of tectonic plates. The climate of the epoch was warmer and more stable than today's. Most of the planet was covered with dense and lush tropical forests. The overwhelming majority of the living creatures of the day were quite small. Thanks to the abundance of vegetable food, they quickly propagated and spread across more and more new areas. This is when the prehistoric ancestors of most of today's mammals thrived. For example, the warm forests of the Paleogene were inhabited by myocids, small and deft predators that looked like martens. It is believed that they were the progenitors of all today's rich diversity of mammal predators. At around the same time, there lived Archaeocetes, the prehistoric ancestors of today's whales. At the time, however, they looked more like hippos. They hadn't gone to live in the sea yet, but had made their first steps in that direction. Their limbs 
Respiratory organs and the inner ear had already started to adapt to prolonged stays underwater. The next epoch our planet went through was the Eocene. It began approximately 56 million years ago and continued for slightly over 22 million years. The contours of the continents had already grown to be quite recognizable. India had finally made it to the southern shores of Asia and as a result of the collision of tectonic plates, giant rock folds formed. That is how the Himalayas rose. The largest mountain range on our planet today. Even though some species of that time already looked like some we might come across today, others were completely different. An example of one of these is Andrusarchus, one of the largest mammal predators that has ever lived on the Earth. Its skull measured up to 84 centimeters, which is roughly one and a half times more than that of the brown bear, and its bite is estimated to have been harder than that of any of today's land predators. It has been inferred from the deep tooth sockets in Andrusarchus's skull, where mandible muscles were attached to, which leaves no doubts as to the bite's crushing force. Reconstruction of its skeleton shows that the animal could measure over 4 meters in length and weigh as much as a ton. Still, interestingly, it looks like this giant carnivore fell into the class of primitive ungulates. Research showed that Andrusarchus's closest relatives were the prehistoric suiforms, hippopotamids and cetaceans. Studies of a few unearthed fossils of its skull and teeth show that the animal must have been omnivorous and even didn't mind eating carrion. Unfortunately, not many bones and fossils of this fascinating creature have been found and scientists are still at odds as to the structure of its organism, habits and relation to other mammal families. The Oligocene was the last epoch of the Paleogene. It is posited that it began around 33.9 million years ago and was over about 23 million years ago, which makes it roughly 11 million years long. This was a time of global cooling. The warm tropical forests were gradually superseded by endless prairies covered with grasslands this is when the Antarctic glaciation began, and an icy shield transformed the green continent of the pole into a lifeless cold desert. Australia continued to drift away from the other continents, while Africa on the contrary was making for the north to meet Europe. After a collision of tectonic plates, mountain ranges formed, and that is how the Alps made their appearance on the map of the world. Around 26-28 million years ago, the supervolcano La Garita furiously erupted on the territory of today's Colorado. In fact, it was one of the major volcanic emissions of the entire Phanerozoic Eon. An area of over 30,000 square meters was buried under a layer of hot ash as much as 100 meters thick. All life within a huge radius around the volcano was destroyed completely. Amazingly, life is able to come to terms with any disasters. The Earth of the time was inhabited by fascinating creatures, some of which were not smaller than dinosaurs in size. For example, Indricotherium, a prehistoric herbivore related to rhinos. Paraceratherium, the largest of these, reached 4.8 meters in shoulder length, which is higher than a large African elephant. Thanks to their remarkably long neck, these giants were able to raise their head up to 7 meters above the ground. Today's rhino would be able to pass under its enormous progenitor's belly, while a human would hardly reach up to touch its knee. With their mass reaching 20 tons, these giants were the largest land mammals of all times. Even Brontosaurus, the most massive of land dinosaurs, weighed just around 15 tons. It still hasn't been established for certain what Andricotherium looked like. Unfortunately, not one entire skeleton of these amazing animals has been excavated so far, only separate fragments from different animals of the species. Most scientists agree that in spite of their relation to rhinos, Indricotherium didn't have a massive horn, although it may well have had a small nose trunk, like today's tapirs. The trunk would have allowed it to pick juicy leaves off treetops. These giant herbivores must have lived in small herds and were constantly on the move around vast stretches of land roaming across their dominions in search of food. Unfortunately, by the end of the Oligocene, Indricotherium had died out completely. At around the same time, the areas they used to inhabit were explored by prehistoric elephants alongside large predators, 
hyenodons, and amphicyonids. The latter are also known as bear dogs. It is thought that the emergence of new large herbivores would have greatly upset nature's balance and Indricotherium would have been forced to fiercely compete for its food. Famine and the threat from the new dwellers of the Asian prairie gradually led to the herbivore's giant's total extinction. Apart from those mentioned, there were some other large predators who were quite common on the Earth in the period from 37.2 to 28.4 million years ago. Antelodons. Fossilized remains of these creatures have been found all over Eurasia. Being even toed ungulates, Antelodons resembled wild boars, although in terms of evolution, these creatures are closer to hippos or even cetaceans. Measuring up to 2 meters in length, they weighed over a ton. A meter-long head had huge jaws complete with all sorts of teeth, sharp incisors, long fangs and wide flat molars. It is likely that Intelodons were omnivores with a preference for predation. Not hampered by their impressive size and bulk, they were able to develop remarkably high speeds, so chances of outrunning such a monster were quite thin. A wild boar the size of a large bull that prefers meat posed a serious threat to any inhabitant of the Earth of that time. That is why it is hardly surprising that Intelodons successfully struggled for their survival for such a considerable time. The period in the history of our Earth that came next was the Neogene. It began approximately 23 million years ago and ended just 2,580,000 years ago. This is when our planet started to look almost, but not quite, what it looks like today. The continents shifted to their today's positions on the planet's surface, and the looks of the most of the plants and animals of the day grew to be familiar to our eye. With the Earth's climate gradually becoming colder, and with droughts occurring more often, polar caps were gradually growing, which culminated in a global glaciation at the end of the Neogene. The planet, meanwhile, was crawling with all sorts of fascinating creatures. The deep-sea dwellers were terrorized by Megalodon, a giant shark measuring 15 meters in length and weighing up to 35 tons. On land, various gomphotheriums could be seen, creatures related to today's elephants. Many of them were the proud owners of four solid tusks. As for the animal's size, some were larger than today's African elephant, whereas others were quite modest in comparison. Around 2.5 million years ago, there started the Quaternary, which is currently the last geologic period in the history of the Earth. It is remarkable for the emergence and evolution of Homo sapiens, as well as its prehistoric ancestors. For example, in the period from 1 million years ago to 100,000 years ago, there lived Gigantopithecus, one of the species of great human-like apes known to science. They measured 3 to 4 meters in height and weighed over 500 kilograms. These creatures lived on the territory of Asia and were related to today's orangutans. It appears that Gigantopithecus would not be able to climb trees like other human-like apes on account of its mass. However, some of them are known to have dwelt in mountainous areas and made homes in natural grottos, caves and ravines. Even though their diet is believed to have consisted of mainly bamboo, bones of herbivorous animals with tooth marks were unearthed in their shelters. Judging by these finds, it is safe to assume that these creatures didn't mind meat and were omnivorous at the very least. The Gigantopithecus's skeleton is similar to that of a gorilla, so they were likely to use all four limbs to move around. Besides, these human-like apes had a comparatively large brain, which means that they could be relatively intelligent and were probably able to even make primitive working tools. Unfortunately, the population of these amazing giants sharply dropped when the prehistoric ancestors of today's human emerged and spread across the planet. By around one to three hundred thousand years ago, they had died out completely. Sadly, not many remains of Gigantopithecus have been found, which greatly impedes studying them. As they were spreading across the Earth, primitive human tribes eliminated many other creatures. One of their victims was Megatherium, a giant ground sloth that used to inhabit South America and part of North America in the period from 2 million to 12,000 years ago. It was really a creature to marvel at. Weighing up to 4 tons and measuring around 6 meters in length, Megatherium was quite as large as the African elephant. 
which is all the more impressive as it generally moved around on its hind legs. Megatherium's happy days ended around 15,000 years ago when nomadic human tribes came to South America. The powerful but sluggish giant was helpless under a barrage of sharp spears and arrows, and very soon its population dropped to zero. Other giants who supposedly became extinct because of humans were Diprotodons, which inhabited Australia in the period from 1.6 million years ago to around 40,000 years ago. These creatures were the largest known marsupials, and they were related to wombats and koalas. Some of these amazing animals reached as much as 3 meters in length and 2 meters in shoulder height. As for their mass, they weighed approximately 3 tons. This makes Diprotodons quite as big as some hippos. Massive and herbivorous, they dwelt on massive woodland and coastal grass-covered plains that abounded in Australia before humans had made their appearance there. Chronologically, the extinction of the marsupial giants coincides with first human tribes arriving to this continent. Still, some scientists maintain that the extinction was caused not by hunting, but an anomaly of the Earth's magnetic field together with a local temperature decrease. The heightened radiation background, coupled with cooling, slowed down plant growth, which led to famine among the herbivores. Thus, it appears that by and large, the tragedy was inevitable, and the humans simply brought it to a close faster. The last epoch of the Quaternary, the Holocene, heralded a robust development of the human civilization, when Homo sapiens spread across the entire planet and dominated all the other inhabitants of our Earth. The downside of this evolution is manifested in a number of industrial disasters and irreversible changes in nature's balance. For example, it is due to human activity that the greenhouse gases concentration in the Earth's atmosphere is getting worse every year. This may globally negatively affect all living things on our Earth, from simplest bacteria to elaborate multicellular organisms. Unfortunately, the number of fascinating creatures living on our Earth is going down every year. It is particularly poignant to realize that they perish because of human stupidity or avarice. Uncontrolled hunting, irresponsible land development and indifference to the environment have already made scientists speak of a new, sixth great extinction event, whose consequences are potentially just as grave as those of the previous five. Will mankind stop before it eliminates itself? How long should it take our planet to recover from the consequences of the technological progress? And will nature produce radically new life forms that would weather this crisis, just like it happened before? We can hardly realistically answer these questions. Mars lies approximately one and a half times as far from the Sun as the Earth. In contrast to our planet, its radius is twice as small, its mass is around 10.7% that of the Earth, and the freefall acceleration on the surface is almost three times as little. The temperature fluctuates between 153 degrees Celsius below zero at the poles and 35 degrees Celsius above zero at the equator. The area of Mars's surface is roughly the same as that of all our continents combined. Its terrain is extremely diverse, with some geological features reminiscent of those of our planet and others quite unique and peculiar. The surface of Mars is currently closely observed from the planet's orbit by eight automatic space probes. The data collected by them reveals that there is a vast light spot in the planet's western hemisphere. This region is the largest volcano in the solar system, and it is known as Olympus Mons. Today, this is the starting point of our tour around the Red Planet. Olympus Mons towers as high as 26 kilometers over the plains surrounding it. This is roughly two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. It is assumed to be a shield volcano formed with multiple sheets of solidified lava. According to today's assumptions about the planet's inner makeup, there are no tectonic plates under the surface, which is why magma's eruption point can remain in the same spot for a long time, for hundreds of millions and even billions of years. That accounts for the fact why ejected lava spills out to cover incredibly vast areas, with a layer that subsequently turns into a rocky shield. 
The average diameter of Olympus Mons measures around 600 kilometers and its area is over 300,000 square kilometers. These figures are comparable with the area of an average-sized European country like Poland or Italy. A giant depression formed with six calderas or collapsed volcanic craters is located in the center of the volcano. The diameter of the depression measures around 85 kilometers and its depth reaches as far down as 3 kilometers. Olympus Mons is so high that the atmospheric pressure at the top is 50 times lower than at the foot. Since the atmosphere on Mars is about 160 times more rarefied than that of the Earth, the conditions on top of the volcano are slightly short of those in the vacuum. That is why the Red Planet's highest mountain cannot expect any visitor probes. The atmospheric density would be too low for parachutes to slow down a descending capsule with a Mars rover inside. With the average slope of Olympus Mons quite small, at only 5%, the volcano's edges end in almost sheer abysses of up to 7 kilometers high. It still hasn't been established for certain how such enormous slopes came to form. According to some assumptions, it was done by an ancient ocean on Mars. Other hypotheses hold sandstorms accountable, which continuously rage in this area. When we climb down from Olympus Mons and fly over its surroundings, we can see that there are lots of overlapping ridges and isolated mountains. Some of these formations stretch as far as a thousand kilometers from the volcano's edge. It is assumed that they may have formed as the giant mountain slopes were eroding, or else due to movements of ancient ice caps. Whizzing on southeast from Olympus Mons, we will find ourselves in a vast region known as Tharsis. This volcanic upland, formed by solidified streams of lava, covers roughly one-fourth of the entire planet's surface. Its area of around 30 million square kilometers is comparable with that of Africa. Interestingly, the upland is 10 kilometers higher than the plains surrounding it, and its age could be about 3.7 billion years. There are a great number of volcanoes here, some of which only slightly smaller than Olympus Mons. Arcea Mons, for example, rises as high up as 19 kilometers, which makes it the second highest peak on Mars. With a summit caldera measuring 110 kilometers, the overall diameter of the mountain is over 400 kilometers. A unique natural phenomenon can be observed over the volcano every year for a short time. As sun rays warm the mountain slopes, small dust spirals into a dense cloud, helped along by air streams going upward. This cloud may float up to 30 kilometers above Arcea Mons and may be scattered by winds across vast areas. Vertical pits can be seen in different places all over the upland. They are quite deep, with the bottoms quite unobservable. The diameter of the largest one measures around 150 meters and its depth cannot be less than 178 meters. These pits are thought to be collapsed lava tubes. Tharsis is made up of dozens of overlapping shield volcanoes. In the billions of years of their eruptions, great amounts of CO2 and water vapor were released into the Martian atmosphere. Mathematical modeling shows that the amount would be enough to shroud the planet with an atmosphere one and a half times as dense as that of the Earth. These estimates are indirect evidence of the fact that in the past, conditions on Mars may have been more favorable for life to originate there than now. With its gravity comparatively weak, however, the planet failed to retain its atmosphere and was eventually stripped of it. Moving on to the east from the plateau, we will get to the region known as Valles Marineris. It is a network of gargantuan canyons stretching for up to 4,500 kilometers. The width of the canyon reaches 600 kilometers and it's more than 11 kilometers deep. Images reveal that the slopes of most of the canyons in the central and western parts of Valles Marineris have a stratified structure typical of deposits at the bottom of a large body of water. It is quite likely that the canyons used to be completely submerged underwater in the distant past. There are some truly invaluable paleontological finds to be extracted from the rock deposits in this region. The eastern part of the valleys are areas with a rather chaotic relief. There are vast labyrinths made up of comparatively small canyons, abysses, mountains and plateaus. Further north, 
the terrain evens out into a relatively smooth plain known as Christ Planitia. Its vast areas became the final resting place for the debris of the Sojourner Mars rover and also for the Viking 1 probe, which sent the first color images of Martian landscapes to the Earth as far back as in 1976. According to the widely accepted hypothesis today, Valis Marineris came to be in the early stages of the planet's formation. Erosion and geological processes were to deepen and widen the canyons later on. One version has it that the systems of Chasmatis is thought to have formed after volcanic eruptions on the Tharsis upland. Another version claims Utopia Planitia to be the cause for their formation, which lies on the other side of the planet. This vast round lowland is likely to be an impact crater from an extremely large asteroid that would have hit the planet's surface. The Planitia's diameter measures some 3,300 kilometers. The terrain of the surface itself is rather flat and smooth. There were several attempts to explore Utopia Planitia by different space probes. In 1979, the Viking 2 lander beamed back panoramic images of its surface to the Earth. In 2016, the Sherard radar on the MRO probe located rich deposits of water ice mixed with dust underground. In May 2021, the Chinese rover Zhurong touched down on Utopia Planitia. It has covered over 1,000 meters of the red planet's surface by now and has beamed back hundreds of images. Unfortunately, it cannot dig as far down as the water-carrying layer, with the latter as deep as 1 to 10 meters down. In the north, Utopia Planitia borders on Vestitas Borealis, a giant lowland surrounding the northern part of the planet and covering about 40% of its total area. Moving southwest from the center of Utopia Planitia, we will reach Isidis Planitia. The region on its western edge has been the focus of people's special attention for almost eight months now. Of course, it is all about the Jezero Crater. It is likely that millions of years ago there used to be a body of water here that has dried up by now. The Perseverance Mars rover and Ingenuity, the first ever helicopter flown beyond the Earth, have been exploring the bottom of the crater since the 18th of February 2021. The Jezero Crater was chosen for the mission because it appeared one of the most promising places to discover traces of Martian life. The crater is posited to have formed around 4 billion years ago after a massive celestial body fell on Mars. The impact crater measured some 49 kilometers. As I've already mentioned, it is thought that it used to be filled with water and the Hesperian of the geological history of Mars is singled out as the most likely period for that. The Hesperian started some 3.5 billion years ago and continued for around a billion years. Atmospheric pressure on the planet at the time is estimated to have been comparable with that on the Earth, with the surface temperature reaching 50 degrees Celsius. Rock samples recently extracted from the crater's bottom by the Perseverance rover are hard evidence of that. They still have to be transported to the Earth for deeper analysis, but it is clear even now that at some point the rocks have continuously been in close contact with liquid water. Perseverance has already delighted scientists with great amounts of useful data, and the mission is still far from being completed. The probe is designed for 14 years of operation, which means that there are still hundreds of finds to extract and kilometers of Martian terrain to cover. That is why our tour around Martian expanses is not yet over. The solar system appears to be a perfectly tuned mechanism when viewed at large. By contrast, there's a real realm of chaos between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. This is where hundreds of thousands of small celestial objects whiz around space in all sorts of directions occasionally crossing other objects' orbits. They sometimes get in each other's way and produce thousands of shards and bits on collision. With this area of space highly changeable, it is hardly possible to predict what it will look like in the distant future. Of course, we'll be talking about the main asteroid belt, one of the most changeable and mysterious areas in the solar system. Today, over 300,000 small celestial bodies found here have been given names and numerical designations. Interestingly, their overall number may well reach over a million. 
The starting point of studying the asteroid belt may be defined at 1801, when astronomers spotted a mysterious object in the sky after a long and hard search for the fifth planet. In terms of its parameters, it appeared to be a planet, but happened to be so small that even the most advanced telescopes of the day couldn't distinguish its disk. The researchers saw the newly discovered object as a bright dot like a star. It was dubbed Ceres, and very soon similar celestial objects of this class were discovered. A new term had to be introduced to refer to them. These unusual astronomical bodies came to be called asteroids, which literally means star-like. Apart from asteroids, this area in the solar system contains great amounts of cosmic dust. While slowly spiraling up, its tiny particles scatter sun rays and create a very faint white glow. This glow is referred to as zodiacal light. Interestingly, in equatorial areas of the Earth, it can be seen with the naked eye. For a long time, the following hypothesis used to be widely accepted. Asteroid belt objects were thought to be debris of a destroyed planet. However, today, this assumption doesn't really hold water. First of all, the mass total of all the objects of the main asteroid belt is too small and equals just 3 times 10 to the power of 21 kilograms, or 4% the mass of the Moon. Even allowing for the fact that the greater part of asteroids would have left the belt a while ago, the total mass of the rocky debris still falls short of making up an object with dimensions comparable to those of a proper planet. Secondly, estimates show that large celestial objects cannot form in this area of the solar system on account of Jupiter's gravitational influence. Mathematical modeling revealed that the largest formations in the asteroid belt have never measured over a thousand kilometers in diameter. The gravitational influence of their mighty giant neighbor rendered their orbits highly unstable, which made potential protoplanets collide and disintegrate into smaller bits. Traces of these collisions can still be observed. Most objects of the main belt group together to form the so-called asteroid families, populations of asteroids of similar makeup and of the same origin. It is thought that they formed as a result of such destructive collisions. The borders of the main asteroid belt are rather blurred. Most of the objects making it up lie within 2.06 to 3.27 astronomical units from the Sun. These boundaries are predefined by Jupiter's tidal forces and are referred to as Kirkwood Gaps. Any celestial objects getting into these zones experience the massive gas giant's strong gravitational influence, which destabilizes their orbits. This is the reason why the space object count here is considerably lower than beyond. Kirkwood gaps can be found not only on the conventional borders of the belt, but inside it too. Two of the most clearly defined gaps lie 2.5 and 2.82 astronomical units away from the Sun. The asteroid belt is also conventionally divided into two large areas, inner and outer belt. The border between them is a Kirkwood gap with a radius measuring 2.5 astronomical units, which coincides with the highest orbital resonance with Jupiter. It's in the outer part of the main belt that the largest object in this area of the solar system is situated, Ceres. This celestial object used to be thought a planet, then an asteroid, but eventually, in 2006, it was given the status of a dwarf planet. It was possible to do so thanks to the fact that Ceres has a spherical shape, unlike the absolute majority of the other objects in the belt. Its diameter measures around 940 kilometers and its mass 9.4 times 10 to the power of 20 kilograms, which incidentally accounts for around a third of the overall mass of the asteroid belt. This makes Ceres approximately 6,000 times lighter than our planet. The furthest point of the dwarf planet's orbit from the Sun is 2.9 astronomical units. When Ceres is at its perihelion, the distance to our system's center measures around two and a half astronomical units. At this point, the planetoid's surface temperature may reach 239 Kelvin or 33 degrees Celsius below zero, although its average temperature is noticeably smaller, at just 167 Kelvin or 106 degrees Celsius below zero. 
The celestial body is thought to be made up of a rocky core enveloped in a cryomantle around a hundred kilometers thick. Water ice accounts for up to half of the dwarf planet's volume, or 20 to 30 percent of its mass. The inner part of the belt harbors the largest and most massive known asteroid in the solar system. Vesta The object's average diameter measures roughly 525 kilometers and its mass is around 2.6 times 10 to the power of 20 kilograms, which is almost four times as little as that of Ceres. The asteroid's orbit is rather elongated, with its aphelion 2.57 astronomical units and its perihelion around 2.15 astronomical units away. It takes the celestial body 3.6 Earth years to complete a full orbit around the Sun. Vesta is also remarkable for being the only asteroid visible to the naked eye. It can be seen not only on account of its impressive dimensions, but also thanks to its comparatively light surface that reflects about 42% of light shed on it. Besides, the minimal distance between Vesta and the Earth isn't that great. At just 177 million kilometers or 1.18 astronomical units, it is assumed that Vesta is a fully-fledged planet in terms of its inner makeup. It appears to have a metallic core made up of nickel and iron, as well as a rocky mantle. The surface temperature of the asteroid is currently fluctuating between minus 190 and minus 20 degrees Celsius, but it used to be much warmer in the past. Dark areas to be seen on the surface in the Western Hemisphere are highly likely to be basalt plains, such terrain features may have formed as a result of volcanic activity or collision events with massive astronomical bodies. The most outstanding geological feature on the asteroid is the giant impact crater referred to as Rhea Silvia, whose diameter measures up to 500 kilometers and its depth is around 25,000 meters. The second largest mountain in the solar system is situated at its center, towering higher than 22 kilometers. Impressively, the crater's diameter almost equals Vesta's size. It looks like the asteroid collided with a really large object at some point in the past. The collision would have produced not only the Rhea Silvia crater, but also a great number of small bits which are now classified as the family of Vesta's numerous asteroids. The family counts over 15,000 objects making up around 5% of all celestial bodies of the main belt known to science today. It is posited that most asteroid families came to be as a result of destructive collisions of two large celestial objects. Sometimes the debris are mutually attracted by gravity forces, which usually blend them into a new astronomical object. However, it would have lost its monolithic nature and sometimes astronomers informally call such formations rubble piles. For example, Sylvia, one of the largest objects in the asteroid belt, seems to fall into this category of celestial bodies. Its parameters are 384 by 262 by 232 kilometers, with a mass 1.5 times 10 to the power of 19 kilograms, this makes the asteroid's average density just 20% higher than that of water. Estimates show that cavities may account for 25 to 60% of its volume. It takes Sylvia 6.5 years to complete a full orbit around the Sun. The object's orbit's furthest point from the center of the system is up to 3.7 astronomical units. In its perihelion, Sylvia gets as close to the Sun as 3.2 astronomical units. It is assumed that some bits of debris left after a collision are not attracted to other bits but rather become satellites of the new celestial body. Sylvia is known to have two such companions, Romulus, with a diameter measuring 18 kilometers, and Remus, measuring around 7 kilometers. Their makeup hasn't been studied yet and it is highly likely that these objects are not monolithic either. Besides, Sylvia may theoretically have smaller satellites as well which haven't been detected yet. Pallas is another remarkable object in the asteroid belt. It was discovered back in 1802 right after Ceres and is the second largest asteroid in the belt. 
The average diameter of the celestial body is around 512 kilometers and its mass is roughly 2 times 10 to the power of 20 kilograms, which is approximately 25% less than that of Vesta. The asteroid's orbit is exceptionally elongated and tilts to the ecliptic plane at 35 degrees. That is the reason why the astronomical body is so hard to investigate with probes. As for its orbital period, it takes Pallas around 4.6 years to orbit the Sun, in the course of which the distance to the system's center changes more than one and a half times, with its perihelion 2.1 astronomical units, its aphelion is 3.4 astronomical units away. Pallas's surface is widely pockmarked with craters, much more so than the larger Ceres or Vesta. Studies of the chemical composition of the asteroid's surface reveal that it mostly consists of silicate rocks with small amounts of iron and water. Just like Vesta, this celestial body is thought to be one of the few potential protoplanets that are still around, which means that studying it may yield important information about the formation process of the solar system. Unlike Vesta, most asteroids cannot be seen either with the naked eye or through amateur telescopes. One of these elusive objects is called Interamnia, admittedly one of the most mysterious objects of the main asteroid belt. This is an irregular shaped asteroid with parameters 362 by 348 by 310 kilometers and its mass accounts for roughly 1.2% of the overall mass of all objects in the belt. In spite of its relatively large size, however, Interamnia remains largely understudied. One of the difficulties thwarting scientific progress here is the asteroid's dark surface, which absorbs around 93% of light shed on it. Interamnia falls into the exceptionally rare spectral class F, which is a subclass of carbonaceous asteroids. Research of its reflection shows that the color of the celestial body's surface is even which means that Interamnia hasn't experienced big collisions for quite a long time. Interamnia's density is not that great, at just twice that of water. The asteroid is thought to be made up of a hard rocky core enveloped in a thick layer of ice. The surface is covered with great amounts of fine dark dust. It takes Interamnia around 5 years and 4 months to complete a full orbit around the Sun. Its aphelion is on the opposite side from four largest objects of the main belt and the distance from the asteroid to the Sun varies from 2.5 to 3.5 astronomical units. In theory, Interamnia's orbit crosses the trajectories of such large objects as Ceres and Pallas, but estimates show that chances of their colliding with each other are small. There are millions of objects in the main belt, from dwarf planets to tiny meteoroids the size of a cobblestone. However, distances between them measure thousands upon thousands or even millions of kilometers. That is why a spacecraft crossing the belt would be running an almost negligible risk of getting hit by any astronomical body. Still, mathematical modeling shows that around once every 10 million years, some remarkable collisions take place in this part of the solar system that produce new debris. Even though a manned mission to asteroids in the main belt will not be in the pipeline for a long while, some of the asteroids there have been studied with the help of interplanetary space probes. For example, the Dawn probe carried out observations of Ceres and Vesta in the period from 2011 to 2016. Quite recently, the space probe Lucy blasted off the surface of the Earth. Even though its main goal is the so-called Jupiter Trojans, the spacecraft will approach the object known as Donald Johansson in the main belt and take its pictures in 2025. Also, the launch of the Psyche project is scheduled for July 2022, with the largest known metallic asteroid of the main belt as its target. Within the mission, the probe is planned to reach its destination by early 2026 and remain in the asteroid belt for at least 21 months while studying the asteroid's terrain, makeup and magnetic field. Between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, there lies the asteroid belt. 
a vast area which is home to hundreds of thousands of relatively small celestial bodies. Ceres, a dwarf planet with a diameter measuring slightly over 950 kilometers, is the largest of the lot. The rest of the space objects in this part of the solar system are considerably smaller. With some of them seen as potential dwarf planets, there is no doubt that their overwhelming majority are asteroids. According to data from February 2021, over a million celestial bodies of this kind have been detected so far, most of which are located in the asteroid belt. The Oort cloud is thought to contain by far larger numbers of these, but it is too challenging to detect them due to their small size and the distances between us and them, which are too great. These celestial objects may well be numerous in the asteroid belt, but their mass total is not that great. According to the most widespread classification, all objects of this type fall into three big groups, carbonaceous, silicate and metallic. The first group contains most asteroids. In fact, roughly 75% of all known asteroids in the solar system are C-type. These are made up mostly of graphite and soot, the simplest modifications of carbon. By contrast, silicate asteroids account for approximately 17% of the overall count. These are rocky celestial bodies made up of predictably enough silicate varieties of rock. The other 8% of asteroids fall into the category of metallic ones, and these are the most valuable from the point of view of commercial exploitation and mining. As the name suggests, metallic asteroids are made up of metals and metal compounds, including those rare to find on our Earth. The reason for this is that as our planet was forming, most heavy elements like gold, tungsten and platinum were pulled to the center of the planet by gravity forces. There they formed a massive core and mantle. Only small amounts of these elements remained at a comparatively small depth, where largely thanks to geological processes, they formed metalliferous deposits. The largest known M-type asteroid Psyche, with a diameter measuring roughly 186 kilometers, contains around 17 quadrillion tons of metal ore, which is at least 20,000 times more than all deposits of these resources that our planet's crust is supposed to contain. Even a comparatively small metallic asteroid, with a diameter of 1 kilometer, contains as much metal ore as is extracted by all countries in the world in the course of a year. Apart from iron, asteroids may be made up of precious and rare earth metals like gold and platinum. The element indium, which is used in the production of touchscreens, is of special interest, as well as extremely rare osmium, rhenium and rhodium to be produced with. As for hydrogen extracted by splitting water using the method of electrolysis, it may be used as fuel for spacecraft. As we can see, small celestial bodies in the solar system may potentially turn out to be almost inexhaustible mines of valuable natural resources. But are we technologically ready to carry out prospecting and mining operations on asteroids? Plan a sci-fi movie today. However, projects of a smaller scale are quite feasible even now. When plans are made to extract this or that resource, a factor to be reckoned with is the ratio of the extraction costs and the value of the resource. Natural resources of our planet are gradually getting depleted, which means that their value is inevitably and inexorably going up. Space technologies, on the other hand, are getting cheaper, which makes some commercial space projects almost cost-efficient. Most small celestial objects may well lie in the asteroid belt, but many are still scattered across the inner part of the solar system. Hundreds of such like objects get close to the Earth or collide with it every year. As a rule, they are relatively small objects and cannot cause any serious destruction. Some of them are made up of tough rocks or metals, others contain substantial amounts of water ice. If a heavy chunk of water ice like that were to be captured and transported to a desired spot, it would potentially satisfy the needs of the International Space Station for many years to come. This is just one example of how attractive and useful they can be. With all the obvious technological shortcomings taken due notice of, a number of projects are already underway in this field. One of these is the deep founded in 2013, it deals with designing spaceships and propulsion systems. Some claims made by the company representatives may well sound fanciful and presumptuous. 
to mention but one, DSI promises to start mining natural resources on an industrial scale on asteroids close to the Earth as soon as this decade. The extracted materials are supposed to be transported to the Earth, while it is envisaged that in the future they will be used actually in space for such undertakings as construction works and production processes away from our planet. Time will show whether these bold projects will be put into practice. Speaking about future plans for exploration of small celestial bodies in the solar system in general, there are three main approaches that can be singled out. The first one involves extracting crude ore and transporting it to a processing point, which may be either in space or on the Earth. The advantage of this approach is the option of employing automated mechanisms that won't need to be manned directly, although on the downside, transporting large amounts of heavy rocks is admittedly a rather complicated and costly procedure. The second approach involves processing extracted ore on site. Both the volume and mass of the final product will be considerably lower, whereas the transportation will be more cost-efficient, with all useless waste rock successfully lost. However, in this case, another tough challenge will have to be faced, namely the construction of a metal processing plant in space. The technological process of extracting pure base metal out of ore requires both great amounts of energy and additional reagents like carbon or big volumes of water. Organizing the entire cycle of production in such conditions may prove to be quite a grueling ordeal. The third approach involves transporting a celestial body to a processing plant in space that would have been constructed and prepared in advance. This centralized approach would solve many of the issues implied by the previous two, although a certain technological advancement is called for. For example, space objects may be transported by pinpoint blasting, towing or else using a pulse detonation engine of some sort that would be mounted directly on the transported body's surface. Unfortunate objects. Incidentally, First experiments of this kind are already in the pipeline. For example, in the upcoming years the European Space Agency is planning to organize a collision between the small near-Earth asteroid Dimorphos and a man-made spacecraft. The collision will not only help to establish the asteroid's makeup, but also see how the collision will affect its orbit. As for the technologies of towing things around in space, eventually they'll by all means develop and get both cheaper and more reliable. Ore smelting is carried out in extremely high temperatures, and heat dissipation in a vacuum may prove to be a serious issue. Rare metals that are especially valuable tend to be distributed rather unevenly in a rock. Their extraction from the rock and purification involve exceptionally elaborate technological processes. Ore gland like this, as well as maintaining its reliable and smooth operation, is hardly possible without a considerable number of staff, both technical people and scientists, residing in orbit. Having to create an environment suitable for prolonged stays of large numbers of people outside the Earth must be reckoned with and remains high on the list of priorities. Still, I will repeat myself by saying that technologies are constantly moving forward at a breakneck speed and what would appear to be unreal even yesterday is already firmly establishing itself in our today's life and living space. Whether it is only our Earth or the entire solar system, we must not harm or destroy them in our search for resources. The beginning of the 21st century heralded a whole bunch of sensational discoveries in astronomy. A number of objects close to Pluto in terms of their size were detected one after another in remote areas of the solar system. One of the first objects to be spotted was Quawa. The discovery was made by Chadwick Trujillo and Michael Brown in 2002 while they were studying images of the star sky taken in Palomar Observatory. At first, the detected object was thought to be slightly smaller than Pluto, but after double-checking, the planetoid turned out to be much smaller. Still, this celestial body remains one of the top 10 largest bodies in the Kuiper Belt. This area in space looks like a remarkably wide ring encompassing the solar system beyond Neptune's orbit. To give you an idea of its size, here are its basic parameters. Its inner radius measures approximately 30 astronomical units, with its outer radius roughly 55 astronomical units. Apart from a number of small objects, there are several relatively large dwarf planets to be found here. Pluto, Eris, Makemake and others. Wawa is one of these two. 
Now let's talk about it in more detail. This celestial body looks like a flattened ellipsoid. Its equatorial diameter measures about 1,138 km and the distance between its poles is 1,030 km or so. This makes Kwawa's diameter about twice as small as Pluto's, with Charon just barely beating it in terms of size. Kwawa's mass is estimated at around 1.4 times 10 to the power of 21 kilograms, which makes it around 10 times lighter than Pluto. Kwawa's average density is approximately 2,200 kilograms per cubic meter, which is typical of dwarf planets. The planetoid is thought to be made up of mostly rocks and water vapor, just like other objects in the Kuiper Belt. Estimates show the intensity of radioactive decay in Kwawa's interior to be too low to melt the lower layers of ice. That is why, in all likelihood, there is no subsurface ocean under the ice shell on this planetoid. Now let's see how freezing cold it is on Kwawa. Its average surface temperature is predictably low, at approximately 44 Kelvin, or 229 degrees Celsius below zero. Even at temperatures this low, frozen gases in the vacuum of space gradually vaporize and form a remarkably rarefied atmosphere that is made up mostly of methane. However, the density of the planetoid's atmosphere is at least a hundred million times lower than that of the Earth. Kwawa is known to be a rather dark celestial body. Reflecting from 10 to 20% of all light shed on it, it has a reddish hue, just like many other celestial objects in those areas of space. This color comes from impurities containing tholins, complex polymers originating in frozen methane when it is exposed to ultraviolet rays. Still, it is assumed that Kwawa contains considerably less ice and frozen gases than larger transneptunian objects mostly on account of its more modest dimensions and a weaker gravity. The freefall acceleration on Kwawa's surface is estimated at a measly 0.29 meters per square second, which is about 33 times slower than on our planet. This means that when hypothetically placed on the planetoid's surface, a human would weigh just 2 or 3 kilos. Investigations and observations show the surface of the object to contain crystalline water ice. However, the detected modification of ice may form only at temperatures not lower than 110 Kelvin or 163 degrees Celsius below zero, which is at least 66 Kelvin higher than the current average temperature on the planetoid. According to one of the hypotheses as to this discrepancy, the detected ice may have formed in the dwarf planet's interior, where the temperatures are higher on account of radioactive decay of heavy elements. The ice probably got ejected as a result of cryovolcanic activity and so spilled out on the surface. Another hypothesis claims the anomalous ice to have appeared on the planetoid as a result of meteorite bombardment. Spectral analyses reveal Kwawa to contain small amounts of solidified methane and ethane although here their concentration is considerably lower than on the surfaces of other, larger transneptunian objects. By slowly evaporating, frozen hydrocarbons replenish Kwawa's atmosphere, although the planetoid's gravity isn't strong enough to keep the gas molecules close to the surface. Thus Kwawa is slowly but surely getting stripped of its atmosphere and in billions of years' time will lose it completely. Like most celestial objects, the planetoid rotates on its axis. The rotation period hasn't been gauged exactly yet, but judging by its luminosity, which repeatedly changes following a certain pattern, it is estimated at roughly 18 hours. Kwawa follows an almost circular orbit around the Sun, which takes it slightly less than 289 years to complete. The orbit eccentricity is just 0.04, which is two and a half times more than that of our Earth and twice as small as that of Mars. It takes sunlight about five hours to reach Kwawa's surface. It has been calculated that the planetoid last reached its aphelion in 1932, with a distance to the center of our system approximately 45 astronomical units. Now Kwawa is on its way to its orbit's perihelion, which is estimated to be reached in about 2075. 
The distance between the planetoid and the Sun will be 42 astronomical units at that point. Its orbit doesn't allow Quawa to approach Neptune closely enough to experience this planet's gravity pull. Such like space objects are referred to as Cubiwanos, and Quawa is a typical representative of this class, alongside Varuna and Makimaki. Quawa's orbit is tilted to the ecliptic plane at an angle of 8 degrees, and this fact leads scientists to believe it to confirm that Neptune did have some gravitational influence on the dwarf planet a long while ago. Currently, Quawa is known to have only one satellite. Dubbed Waywat, it was detected in 2006. This small astronomical body follows a moderately elongated orbit around the planetoid. Its aphelion is estimated at approximately 16.5 thousand kilometers. In its perihelion, Waywat is anything from 12,000 to 13,000 kilometers away from the surface of the dwarf planet. The satellite completes a full orbit around Quawa roughly every 12 and a half days. To date, its orbit's other parameters haven't been gauged with any degree of certainty yet. Waywat's diameter measures around 170 kilometers. Assuming the dwarf planet and its satellite are similar in terms of their makeup, Waywat should be 2,000 times lighter. The gravity of an object this light is not enough to make it spherical. This must be the reason why Waywat's shape is irregular, just like that of most other asteroids and small astronomical bodies in the solar system. Taking into account the current stage of space technology's development, it is estimated that it would take a space probe slightly over 13 and a half years to reach Quawa. To date, only the New Horizons probe has approached it closest. In 2016, it took a number of images of Quawa from a distance of 14 astronomical units. It is known that astronomers in the US and China considered an option of sending an automatic space probe to remote objects of the solar system, and Quawa was on the list of potential objects of interest. Still, so far there were no official announcements and confirmations as to planned scientific missions there. And so, just like countless other worlds out there, Quawa is still waiting for its pioneers. Roughly half a year before this video was posted, on the 15th of April 2021, the automatic space probe New Horizons became the fifth spacecraft in the history of the humanity to go beyond the point of 50 astronomical units from the Sun. It was the voyages that had crossed this mark before, with the probes Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 the first ever to do so. None of these space wanderers are likely to ever return to the Earth. With some of them still active on their missions, others have gone quiet forever. Spacecraft New Horizons Start of mission 19th of January 2006 Distance to Earth 52 astronomical units Speed 14 km per second or 3 astronomical units per year Main goal Pluto and Charon Mission status Successfully completed Condition Operational Just like most other interplanetary space probes New Horizons performed a gravity assist maneuver near Jupiter before setting out to its target. Not only did it greatly boost the spacecraft's speed, but also allowed it to capture high-quality images of the largest planet in the solar system alongside its satellites. Besides, the probe's cameras captured the first video ever of an erupting volcano on the surface of Jupiter's satellite Io. After the gravity boost had been completed, the probe made for the main target. Pluto. The spacecraft reached the planetoid's environs in January 2015. The mission's main goal was to explore Pluto and Charon from different perspectives that involved taking photos of and mapping these remote space object surfaces. In addition, the probe estimated the magnetic field's values and the solar wind activity close to the objects and collected information about their atmospheres and surface reflection properties. It goes without saying that the program also involved search for Pluto's as-yet-undetected satellites 
and more accurate measurements of Pluto's orbit's parameters. Having completed the main mission, the probe continued to be useful. It flew beyond Pluto's orbit and went on to explore objects in the Kuiper Belt. That is how images of Kwawa, R1 and Arakoth were produced. Thanks to the probe's cameras, the distances to the stars Proxima Centauri and Wolf 359 were measured. Unfortunately, the radioisotope generator on board the spacecraft is expected to start running low from 2026 and eventually all the meters will switch off one after another. New Horizons will continue on its way beyond the boundaries of the solar system and by the year 2038, the distance between the probe and the Sun will have grown to be a hundred astronomical units. By that time, the energy generator on board the spacecraft will have stopped operating completely and it will be impossible to get any connection with it. Following a hyperbolic orbit, New Horizons will exit our system, never to come back. The same thing happened with two other probes, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. They hit an escape trajectory from the solar system a while ago. In fact, they were the first automatic space probes ever to be sent into interstellar space by humans. Spacecraft Pioneer 10 Start of mission 3rd of March 1972 Distance to Earth 127 astronomical units Speed approximately 12 kilometers per second or two and a half astronomical units per year. Main goal, Jupiter. Mission status, successfully completed. Condition, not operational. The spacecraft reached Jupiter's system on the 4th of December 1973 after completing a 641 day journey through space. During the mission, images of the gas giant's surface and its largest satellites were beamed back to the Earth, and the planet's atmospheric composition and magnetic field were gauged. In addition, Jupiter was found to emit two and a half times more thermal energy than it receives from the Sun. The data, unique at the time, became the basis for understanding the makeup of gas giants and their satellites. The trajectory of the second probe, Pioneer 11, through space passed Jupiter too, but its main target was the other gas giant of our system, Saturn. The probe's scientific instruments gauged the planet's magnetic field and the cameras on board took quite a few snapshots not only of the gas giant itself and its system of rings, but also two of its satellites, Titan and Mimas. According to the estimates, the current distance between Pioneer 11 and the center of our system is around 106 astronomical units. On completing their main mission, both probes continued on their way, moving further and further away from the Sun. Unfortunately, both of them are out of range now, with the last signal from Pioneer 10 received back in 2003. The last signal from Pioneer 11 was received in 1995. Supposedly, both of them are now rapidly moving beyond the boundaries of the solar system. Incidentally, Having no chance of ever catching up with either of the two probes we are going to talk about next, the Pioneers were launched at a much earlier date. Spacecraft Voyager 1 Start of mission 5th of September 1977 Distance to Earth 154 astronomical units Speed Around 17 km per second or 3.6 astronomical units per year Main goal, Jupiter and Saturn. Mission status, successfully completed. Condition, not fully operational. The contribution of Voyager 1 to the solar system's exploration can hardly be overestimated. It is thanks to this probe that several new Jupiter satellites were discovered, alongside its ring system, which was big news. The Voyager's cameras captured volcano eruptions on Io, and provided hard evidence that Jupiter's great red spot is an enormous storm. The probe beamed back hundreds of photos of the largest planet of our solar system and its satellites. After the spacecraft crossed Neptune's orbit, the meters on board sent back a great amount of valuable data about interstellar plasma. Voyager 1 left both the Kuiper Belt and the heliopause behind a long while ago, and is now rapidly crossing the area of the solar system's scattered disk. 
making for the inner boundary of the hypothetical Oort cloud. It is not only the remotest man-made object in space, but also the fastest of all the spacecraft on their way to exit our system. Being the first space probe to have traveled that far from the center of the solar system, Voyager 1 offered scientists a unique opportunity to study the heliopause. This is the area around our Sun where solar wind pressure and interstellar gas pressure balance. When the charged particles emitted by the star collide with rarefied plasma, elaborate structures form out of elementary particles and magnetic fields. Studying them is crucial for understanding processes taking place in the universe. Unfortunately, by around the year 2025, the power of the radioisotope thermoelectric generators on board the probe will have run out completely and the connection will have been lost. In 300 years, Voyager 1 is estimated to reach the inner boundary of the hypothetical Oort cloud. It will take the spacecraft approximately 30,000 years to go clean through and after that it will fly beyond the boundaries of the solar system. 10,000 years later still, the probe will fly by the star Gliese 445 at a distance of 1.6 light years and then it will eventually get lost in the infinite depths of outer space. Speaking about Voyager 1, we can't but mention its twin, launched from the Earth on the 20th of August 1977. Voyager 2 had Saturn, Uranus and Neptune for its targets, but it also approached Jupiter for a gravity boost. It's the images taken by this probe that allowed scientists to assume that there are subsurface oceans on Ganymede and Europa. On reaching Saturn, Voyager 2 gauged the gas giant's temperature and magnetic field and discovered several new satellites. It goes without saying that lots of snapshots were taken of both Saturn's surface and its rings. Next in line on the probe's way were Uranus and Neptune. The flyby yielded a great number of unique snapshots and in total 17 of the two planet's satellites were discovered. Also it was found that both Uranus and Neptune have ring systems. Under Neptune's gravitational influence, the spacecraft changed its trajectory and left the ecliptic plane. This meant that Voyager 2 wouldn't be able to approach the other objects in the solar system, but it still had other exciting things to look forward to. Thus, the probe was to collect invaluable data about interstellar plasma and cosmic wind as well as to measure distances to stars and explore the heliosphere. The probe is currently as far as 128 astronomical units away from the center of our system, with the distance growing by 15.37 kilometers every second. It's going to take it around 42,000 years to approach Ross 248, a dim red dwarf in the constellation Andromeda. The minimal distance between Voyager 2 and the star will be about 1.7 light years and around 300,000 years since its launch, chances are it will fly by Sirius at a distance of 4.3 light years. Unfortunately, it is impossible to distinguish such a tiny object from the Earth that far away. We live at the dawn of space exploration and interplanetary space probes are just mankind's first timid steps in exploring the infinite universe. It is hard to predict their fate. They may be smashed on collision with the celestial body, or they may be recaptured by our distant descendants, who will have advanced into stellar travel technologies to the point of being able to catch up with the probes. For all we know, they might recover them from space and put on display in a museum but it is more likely that the fragile apparatuses are destined to drift on for years and years through the lifeless expanses. And millions of years later, radioactive rays and rare particles of cosmic dust whizzing through the probes time and time again will eventually wear them down to threadbare debris to be scattered across the depths of the universe without a trace. Our journey could certainly have been much longer as any object in the solar system is unique and attractive in its own way. We cherish the hope of being able to update you on each and every one of them in the future. Science is always pushing beyond the limits and this means that what seemed just a flight of fancy yesterday may well become real tomorrow.